Hello, everyone. This is Lee Andrews with Akathame. And today with me, I have Ira Wolf, who is going to join me in a discussion about assessments, personal personality assessments, communication assessments that you may have often taken uh, in either getting a job or while you're on a job for management purposes. But before we go any further, I want to give Ira an opportunity to introduce himself and what his organization does, because we are very, very fortunate to have him steal away 30 minutes of his time today. So Ira, would you like to introduce yourself and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Lee, and uh, welcome, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I have a company, uh, Success Performance Solutions. Um, I've had it for about 25 years, and primary focus, uh, as my tagline says, is we help people uh, recruit faster and hire smarter. And uh, we do that uh, for about 20-some years. Uh, but we are primarily focused on the hiring part, and we do that through pre-employment leadership assessments, and we're, we're going to get into a lot more of that, what that means uh, over the last few years. And as sort of a hobby and a passion, I've always followed uh, workforce trends, what the work, you know, what, what, was, what was the world of work going to be? And, um, you know, certainly the pandemic crisis has, has, uh, has really kind of taken a lot of what we were talking about to be true, although we were expecting technology to basically be the tipping point, and it turned out to be a virus was yeah. actually the thing that forced us. Now, technology enabled us to be able to do a lot of these changes, but uh, it, it changes. So, um, you know, I also do a lot of writing, published a couple books. Uh, Perfect Labor Storm was the first one, which sort of predicted the environment we were in now. Um, but the latest was recruiting in the age of Googleization, where we help people not necessarily recruit. I, I don't, I'm not a recruiter. I'm not a staffer. I mean, that's, that's not my background. Um, but I am a marketer, you know, to basically what drove the business. And so we talked a lot about how companies need to better be better to improve their brand, uh, their messaging, uh, be more customer centric. And I know you talk a lot about that with UX. Uh, and uh, so it's sort of that's where I think our, our paths had crossed through yep. our mutual friend, Debbie Levitt, yep. uh, who introduced me to what UX really was. And said, "No, you're not. I'm not a UX specialist, and I don't know anything. Enough. I know enough to be capable. Um, but her, like <laughs> yeah, but her, uh, her candidate, her her CX, uh, her four horsemen, just resonated with me, and it explained yeah. all the problems with the recruitment marketing. So, so, oh, that's yeah. cool. so on a day to day basis, I spend most of my time working with clients, helping them hire better. Uh, but a lot of a lot more emphasis is spent on how they how they should be recruiting a little bit better too." So let's talk about these assessments. There are a multitude of assessments out there. And the reason that I asked you specifically to talk about this is that you have a bird's eye view of a number of different assessments. And you've been studying this for quite some time. Um, and the other reason is, is that every assessment I have ever taken, I just want to look at it. And, and I usually have one of two reactions. I either want to crawl up in a fetal position in the, in the corner going, how can anybody possibly work with a person like this that's on this paper? And then the other is, this isn't me. Who is this person? <laughs> right? Or, or maybe I've got some components of it, but, you know, I'm not really all that outgoing. Turn that light switch off at the end of the day, and I don't say boo to anybody. <laughs> so, so, how do, so I want to understand how do organizations – utilize the various assessments that are out there for how do they really use it for employment? Because right now people are looking for jobs, right? And if they're asked to take one of these assessments, I think they're going to be a little concerned about it. So how how should they be, how are companies looking at it and how are how should employees look at it or candidates, I should say? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And, and as you even were kind of framing it, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, my, my smart ass answer was, that they don't use it well. <laughs> they don't use. They either don't use it at all, which is even worse than not using them, uh, or they don't. Which I'll explain. Or they don't use them very well, the way that they were intended to be done. But assessments, sort of in the workplace, have been around for a hundred years. And actually, in the uh, in World War One, so it's more a little bit more than a hundred years. Um, the the military started using it IQ tests. Uh, and, which they found, which basically I'm not a big fan of IQ tests, cognitive tests. We, we do test. Um, but as far as the IQ, you know, how smart somebody is, it didn't make them a good soldier, didn't make them a bad soldier. Uh, but that, that was sort of the first round of that. And then a lot of the personality assessments started to come into play. Um, one of the challenges, well, I'll, I'll roll that clock back. 
where where companies are trying to improve hiring. And that's the only reason to use an assessment, you know, to, to get the digs or get the insight on somebody um, is, is, you know, is nice to know, but the, to be lawful, to follow the rules, a company needs to abide by EEO, the EEOC, and Department of Labor. In order to do that, the assessments have to be job relevant. Um, so not only do they have to be accurate, but they have to be job, you know, basically pertain to things that people would do in the job. And there's a million assessments out there, you know, figuratively speaking. Um, there's skill tests. I mean, we, I just had a, two calls this morning. Hey, do you have something for typing and data entry? Um, you know, so those are some, uh, you know, can they use Word and Excel? Um, are they a good multitasker? Uh, so those are technical skills that you can test for. But then people say, well, we're looking for somebody who's motivated, uh, energetic. They have, they share our values. Um, you know, they're outgoing, they're personal, they got good interpersonal skills, they're detail oriented, they're goal oriented. I mean, everybody throws out these terms. Now, this is where it gets interesting because people will rely on the interview uh, as a primary tool to be able to do that. But every single study that has ever been done on the interview has indicated that it's, it's t at best, it's a little bit better than flipping a coin. And, it, and, and for most people, especially a lot of hiring managers who haven't been trained, and because the interviewee, the candidates have been through career coaching, they've been, they've, they've been taught how, even on outsourcing. If somebody's let go, the companies provide them training how to get another job. So job seekers practice and learn how to be interviewed where the people doing the interviews, and I'm not talking about experienced recruiters and HR people, but most people that are doing the final interview have really not been trained. So the, the, the likelihood of them getting a good hire is pretty poor. That's where assessments come in because assessments when, if you're using the right assessment at the right time and you're using it for the right reasons, then it provides you a third party view, an objective view. And it shouldn't make the decision for, for the company, for the hiring manager, but it should say, oh, I didn't think of it that way. Or just as you indicated is, hey, she came across and she was very outgoing and engaging and I felt really good and she was super animated and enthusiastic. Um, but the assessment says she's not. So it gives you an opportunity to explore that because if someone hired you and expected you to be on, literally on 100% of the time, then they that you'd burn out. You, you may be able to do the job for a short period of time, but you'd burn out. So it's important to know, um, you know, how they fit, what their engagement's gonna be like, how they fit on a perfect team. Um, you know, just because you close your door, you know, after you've just had this huge meeting and you just had to get some quiet time, or you turn down people's invitations to go out to dinner after a really full day, doesn't mean that you don't like them and you're not a good team player. It just means you need to unwind for 15 minutes or a half hour. And people completely misread that. So there's there's lots of ways to use assessments in there. And there's a lot of different assessments that are out there for sure. What is the wrong way to use these assessments? An out, a flat out wrong way? Um, certainly to discriminate. I mean, that's, a, that's the biggest thing. It's like, hey, you know, we need smart people um, you know, to work for us, which is always, you know, an issue, or we need people with the college degree, um, you know, four year degree, or we need them with five years experience. And then because of that, you autom you, you automatically exclude people, a lot of minorities, a lot of lower income, a lot of socioeconomic groups, a lot of ethnic groups. Um, and that's, but there are people that intentionally have done that. It's like, hey, you know, we can't discriminate against the blacks and Hispanics and lower income. But if we use an assessment, then we're making it legal. So that's like the ultimately bad reason to use it. But there are companies that do it. The The other reason is not to, to it's not so much there, there's really not. Well, there, there are bad assessments, but assuming you're using tests that have been validated, reliable, and you get good support and they got good documentation. Assuming that that's the type of testing that you're using, then almost all the mistakes that have been made and the bad ways to use them are using the wrong test for the for 
and expecting something else. So a lot of times we'll say we're so we're looking for somebody who's detail oriented, uh, a good team player. They're they're uh, good. They're goal oriented. Um, they they share our values. And you go, OK, yeah, we can measure that. I mean, I've got seven different platforms I use on any single day. And sometimes we have to integrate. And you it'll go, how much is it? And I go, hundred dollars. Oh, we don't want to spend that much on anybody. OK, which parts are most important then? Oh, you, you can't ask you can't ask 50 questions and figure out this the entire psychology behavior cognitive ability aptitude attitude integrity of someone i'm sorry you can't get that from 50 questions because you need multiple questions and that's what people hate again well they ask me the same question six times yeah you need that you need that to validate it and to make it and to ensure its reliability so you know a lot of times people want everything for a little bit. And that's what I ultimately, my, my approach to people when I get called and, and I get two, two common questions. We, um, can you send us information about testing? That's number one. And the second is how much does it cost? And I said, I can't tell you really how much it costs, but we, you know, they average from a few dollars per employee to a few hundred dollars per employee. Okay. Tell me what you want to find out. What are the top three things you need to know? And my second part of that question is, if you're sitting across that person a year from now, they're still working for you. And what is it that you expect, you expect them to complete, to do? How will you measure their success? So one is, what are the things you want to measure? And more important, how will that play into what's successful 12 months from now when you're sitting across that person. You know how how hard that is for people to come up? Well, we're working on that now. You know, it's like, well, what is it? Do they, let's say a salesperson, because everybody understands that. Do they have to bring in X number of leads? Do they have to reach a revenue goal, a profitability goal? Do they have to generate their own leads? How many do they have to do? Um, is it, a, is it a competitive environment? Are you well known in that environment? So what is it that they that you're going to say, this person achieved these three things, and I'd like to hire 10 more people like them? I can't so they're, get so they're using those people as a benchmark. Is that right? So well, one I'm of asking, the well, is a benchmark? Well, even without the benchmark, I'm just saying in general, how will you measure the success of that person a year from now? Right. And from that, if they're not clear, if they go, well, we want them to increase revenues, how much? At what, what, how much, how difficult will it be? Do you, and hey, if they increase revenues, is it because you have a great marketing plan and you're just throwing lots of leads at them? Or do they have to pound the pavement or pound the, the keyboard and find those leads? Um, that's a different type of a person. So there are people that can do really well if you hand them the leads or are, is the job scripted. So my 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 rule of thumb is tell before I recommend an assessment, tell me what is it that you need to accomplish? OK, what how are you going to measure that person's success? Or if they're struggling with that, it's saying, OK, what are the top three things you'd like to know about this person? If I could tell you anything, I can peer into my crystal ball and tell you anything you want to know. Is it that they can type 50 words a minute, that they really are proficient in Excel or that they're in the top 10 percent of being a team player or they're assertive or they're detailed or they're analytical? What is it that you absolutely have to know in order to move forward with this person? So, yeah, I'm sure they do. So if they were to, however, so if you've got these, you've got a group of people within an organization who are really exceptional at what they do on every level, right? Mm -hmm. their, their interpersonal skills, their, their business acumen, their ability will stay with sales to grow business um, consistently year over year. If I wanted to say what makes the, if I'm asking, if I come to you and I, I ask, Ira, I want to know what makes these people tick because I need to create a hiring protocol that allows me to determine whether or not I'm going to have a better chance with the future hires being just like this. Or do they, and I should say, or do they come to you or could they come to you and say, 
I want to be able to work with juniors, junior people to get them to that level to, to help coach them. Right. Um, is that, a, that, that seems to a reasonable way of utilizing assessments. Is that, is that a fair, fair statement? That's how they're utilized. It's not always the best way. So let, let, you, have, you said a lot there. Let me unpack that. So one of the most common ways that people say is, I'd like to test this on, you know, if it's a larger organization, can we test this on our 25 top performers? So if it's a small organization, they go, we have two people that have been with me for a long time. Can we do that? Uh, and, and that's technically, I mean, that's a pretty small benchmark to be able to do it, but it's, it's okay. The, the challenge with benchmarking existing people is it assumes that your process was good in the first place and it wasn't biased. So if, you know, my analogy is in my family, my, my story, my, and I'll stick to it. My story in my family is uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm five, nine. I, I used to be five, nine. I'm probably five, eight and a half, five, closer to five, eight at the moment. But my, my father was five, four. My mother is now about five, two, but she was probably about five, four. My brother's about five, four. I was always tall. And third, when I had my bar mitzvah at 13, I towered. I was literally a head above. <laughs> my, my family. Wow, how did you become so tall? And I was one of the tallest kids in my class. And then all my classmates, all my best friends had growth spurts. And all of a sudden, they're all over six foot. And uh -huh. I wasn't tall anymore. So if I only hang around people that are five, eight or smaller, I'm tall. If I then have a more diverse, open view, I'm normed. And I'm not that tall and I'm not the tallest person in the room. What happens with a lot of times is examples, go back to salespeople. If you only hire extroverts or you use a tool like D DISC and you go, we've tested and only D's and I's work around here. And for those who don't know the DISC system, it's being, it's being energized by directness, energized by interacting, energized by being steady, energized um, by being conscientious. So it's the four Ps. Um, are you energized by problems, people, pace, or procedure? So there's certain people that are energized by solving a problem. Certain people are de-energized by solving a problem. That's all it measures. But what happens is they do that and they say, you know, we tested it and 85% of our people are DIs. And the people who weren't didn't work. Now, now that may be true that 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 they didn't work out. That part may be true. What's not true is why didn't they work out? It may be because your incentives, it may be because of your managers, it may be because you didn't hire enough of them, or it may be because, hey, we're going to hire this one guy because he's got a good resume and he's got a lot of experience and he comes highly recommended, but he's an, you know, he's an SI and therefore the manager looks at him and says from the beginning, I don't know if he's going to work out he's not really assertive enough. Mm. Give you a case study that this was done on. One of my jump starts in this business, I started it in 96, but in, in 99, I was approached by a client. who He happened to be a client. It was a three person company, a tech company. And they had, the three partners had really, really different personalities. So their accountant, who was my accountant, recommended that they get an assessment. And it was like, why? how can we get along better? How, you know, where, how, what do we need to do? Um, but he got bought out. He got bought out by a company. It was in dot com boom. They bought out twenty five companies like him, and Kirk became the, responsible for building the sales organization nationwide. He had no experience doing this, so he said, "Can you help us? Can you put it together in assessments? And can you help us recruit?" So I partnered with a recruiter, who's still a good friend of mine, a colleague. I jump started her business, and we identified the people. And this was a, I, I won't give the name, but it was a large company. And they said, we're going to assess, can you assess our 25 best people? And we did. And exactly what happened was, is they had that profile of, you know, extroverts and, and, high, and the, what the high performers were. And there were two or three people, there was actually two guys, there, there were two people that were very, very different. They, were, they weren't super assertive. They were very patient. They were a little bit slower paced, highly detailed, highly analytical. Well, after the first year, they wanted to fire him. And, but they couldn't because they were both minorities. <laughs> so they said, no, 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 we, we can't do that, but we'd like to get rid of them. At the end of the second year, the only two people that made their goals, the only, 
driven by 80% of the income, happened to be these two people. And these two people had a slow, methodical, analytical approach. You know what their target market was? Education and government. Well, yeah. So when they, so the the selling cycle, the the startup selling cycle was we need to get revenues within a year so we can get more funding and we want to go public. The reality of it was their best target base, their target audience, and their best audience was government and education and nonprofits who were slow at the yeah. project. The two who made it, the two that drove all their incomes happened to be the two that said didn't fit the cycle. So part of the problem I'm doing these benchmarkings if if you if you understand what your market is and the market's going to stay the same and these people are all measured by the same criteria then the benchmarking will work for a short period of time but it also excludes a lot of other, other opportunity the other problem is when you look at using an assessment like that if you only hire d's and i's you only are, you you basically are looking at 55 um, like 55% of the population which means that automatically your assessment excludes 45% of the population. Now, we just came out of you know low unemployment. You couldn't exclude people based on a profile. And people say, the profile's not working. Well, the profile worked. It's just that you just wanted to focus on the one part of it. And it was, so how, so the question should be is, if this person's got the experience, they've got the education, um, but they just don't have the exact profile match. Well, that's where it helps you interview a little bit better. You use the assessment to open those doors up. And then you say, how could we help that person be successful in our environment? What should the rewards, recognition, and compensation look like for that person? Who would be the best manager to carry that person forward, to guide them, coach them, mentor them? Um, because they, everybody has the ability to be successful. Uh, but basically using the assessment as exclusively a knockout. Um, you asked me earlier, what's one way that people can use it wrong is only using the assessment as a knockout. Um, now, I will tell you that for frontline people, when you've got a thousand people applying for 10 positions, then assessments sometimes become that knockout. But it's a combination of, hey, we screened this person, we thought they were eligible, and then we brought the assessment in. But, you know, with a score of zero to 100, what it does is, you know, you're basically prior, you have to prioritize somewhere. And if you're prioritizing only on your interviewer, only on the resume, I mean, everybody lies on a resume anyway. So, you know, it's not a very reliable tool. So basically is that is the assessment allows you one one third of another piece. And it's 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 a three-legged stool is you should be evaluating somebody on their resume, on their interview, and on the assessment. Now the assessment may be the third nail in the coffin on that, uh, or it may expose some liabilities or, or, or vulnerabilities on that, but it gives you just one more piece of the information. But in no way do I say, hey, only use an assessment to 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 weed people out. But assessments um, I, I started to tell you, uh, you know, we talked about the assess the interview being about 50 to 55 percent reliable at best. That's if the if that's if the higher if, if the interviewer is really, really good and the interviewee is not better than they are and the environment's right and it's the right time. Um, an assessment increases the pro the like the success anywhere between to 70 to 80 to percent. Hmm. If you use an assess an interview, if you use an assessment to improve the quality of the interview, because it allows you to focus on the vulnerable areas and on the strengths. Okay, the combination of those two um, really increases the reliability. And I, I'm not speaking from my numbers. I mean, there's some there's there's some really really good studies that are out there uh, that enable you to do that. the The other thing going forward that's really complicated things is is interviewing was tough face to face and now it's remote. I mean, almost almost all interviews have been conducted remote and people weren't prepared for that. So the interviewee is now off because they're not comfortable being interviewed. The hiring manager or HR or recruiter may be a little off because recruiters have been doing it for a while, but a lot of HR and, and hiring managers haven't. 
So now their demeanor is off, their psyche is off, they're uncomfortable. They're trying to read body language from, you know, here up. <laughs> um, and so it is w w every company basically needs a, to become better at that. I'm not suggesting using assessments instead of that, but become better at remote interviewing. But they also need to have a, an objective part of that puzzle and that's that's how assessments that's where assessments can help so again i'm not suggesting that you have an assessment and, and just say oh they, they don't fit we're only looking for that but if they if they have other qualifications if they have the experience they have the education they they they're highly recommended they seem like they'd be a good cultural fit then use the assessment to see how we can make it work not why they shouldn't work okay so um I do want to read a comment from Eric. I'm going to butcher this last name. Puplumpu. <laughs> I'm not sure. I side with Ira on the assessment metrics as some candidates might possibly not check all the requirement boxes, but with the right attitude and communication gestures could win a candidate over. Uh, so let's talk about assessments that are used um, post-hire but to improve communications throughout the organization. So improve communications throughout an organization means that you're able to get more done, hopefully more efficiently in a more pleasant environment and performance overall improves. And I will say that I did the DISC uh, in 2014. It was a bit of an aha moment for me, but it certainly did help as a leader and as somebody who worked throughout the enterprise within the organization, <clears throat> excuse me, and at my clients, um, it helped me understand the motivators for other people when I was able to see their disc. So I was able to um, change my communication style to make it more effective for them. And I thought that was pretty cool. Is, is, is what's your experience? Is that, is that normal or is that, is that what we should be doing? Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And when I get called a lot, they, you know, people never call me for for conflict. Uh, well, they then people tend not to when things are going well, they don't call people like myself for team building. It's usually when there's something oh, going on underneath. Most, most there's some people that do it proactively. Hey, we're having an annual event. We want to do a team building exercise. Uh -huh. Most calls you get on the spur of the moment happens to be because there's a conflict, there's a personality conflict, there's an interpersonal conflict, but they disguise it as we want to we want to work as a better team, and we don't want to call anybody out for their bad behavior. So can we do that? And my conversation usually comes down to okay, so who are you trying to fix? If you got ten people on your team, who are the one or two people that aren't getting along? And you know they laugh and they say, no, 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 we really want to have a better team. And I go, I understand that's what your outcome is. But what you're really hoping is that you can give an assessment to these 10 people. You don't want to call out the two people. So we'll test the 10 uh, or assess. It's not really a test, but we'll assess the 10. Uh, and these two people are going to go just like you did. Oh, now I get it. I need to change my behavior to fit in. It's not that they don't like me. It's that it's me. Well, guess what? That never that never happens on its own because people are going to say, Oh, they tested me and now they want to fire me because I don't look like the rest of the other people. Okay. Hmm. If you do it as a delivery, if or evil, it, all it says is, what energizes you? Am I energized by pe pay, uh, problems, people, pace, and procedures? That's yeah. it. That's all DISC or similar Myers-Briggs or a lot yeah. of these other assessments does. So you, you take that down. Now, by doing that is then... This this shows you what those assessments do better than saying who you are. It basically says, how do other people see you? So, so you see yourself as, if you're a D, you see yourself as direct. You're willing to say what needs to be said. There's a sense of urgency about you. If you're a high I, you're, you love to, to in, interact. That's the I part. I I'm energized by interacting with other people. They hate this pandemic. They need to be involved with other people. And Zoom calls and these type things are, are secondary, but at least it, it allows people to still do it. You okay. know, if you're an F, you like a steady pace. That doesn't mean you don't like change. It just means you like predictability. If you're high C, you're energized by following the rules. Doesn't mean you like the rules, but you're energized. Hey, at least I did it and I got it done on time. I hated doing it, but I got it done on time. 
what happens with that is, is how do other people see you? Well, high Ds are seen as aggressive. High Is are seen as um, self-centered and lightweights. And they're always taught, you know, they're, they're, they always want to be the center of attention. High Ss are seen by, hey, they never want to change. They never want to, they, they, they always are, they're slow thinkers. They're not smart. And high Cs are, hey, you know, you're, you're a, a nitpicker. You, no one ever can get it right. Well, how does one part of the world see you as analytical and precise and the other part sees you as a nitpicker? Mm. And you say, if you put it all out on the table and go, I didn't realize I was doing that. I see a different side of you now. I didn't. So it, it's basically, I'm now aware of how I, you're now aware of how, how I see you. You're aware of how, how you see me. And hopefully you are both human enough to say, we want to make this work. So you know what? When you come in in the morning and I'm here at 630 and I have my door just slightly cracked, I came in early to get my work done. And every time you you knock on the door and go, hey, Lee, how you doing? And come in, hey, just wanted to say hello. And I sit down in the chair across the table. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of the next day, I say, I don't want Ira knocking on my door anymore at 630. I came in early to get work done. I like him, but I'm here to get work done. Mm -hmm. So I close the door and I come in and go, Lee. Oh, boy. <laughs> and I don't answer. And he keeps knocking and then he opens the door because he saw you come in and I walk in the door again. By the third time, you put a lock on the door. And <laughs> And Lee said, and Ira's saying, Lee doesn't like me anymore. Oh. She's a real B. You know, I, and I thought we were working on a team around here. And it goes downhill. And all of a sudden, you do one of these exercises, and people go, so that really, I didn't realize I bothered you when I came in. I was just coming in for five minutes to say hello. It's all that little stupid stuff that gets yeah, in yeah. You know, I was very so the assessments, the assessments on a leadership, on a team building, 50 percent of issues. And I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been using DISC for 35 years. 50 percent of the issues using a tool as simple as DISC, 10 minutes. Takes the edge off. Now, that also means that there's 50 percent of the problems still exist. Right. And then, and they may be deeper. It may be different values. There may be, you know, people have psychological problems. They have problems at home. There's different things. But if you if you could literally within a, an hour remove 50 percent of the all the personality conflicts in your workplace, would you do it? And everybody says, yeah. Is it perfect? No. Does it mean that there's still going to, there's not going to be any conflicts later or that people aren't going to get along? So when, when people use a tool like that, I don't recommend tool, disc for hiring, by the way, I, I recommend it as far as on a team fit. If you're saying we want to know how this person's going to communicate, do they fit in the team? Do they fit in our culture? That's fine. If you're using it to say, well, we only need salespeople who are DIs or accountants who are SCs. Okay. Um, it doesn't just because you're energized by details doesn't mean you're good at it. Just because you're energized by getting results fast doesn't mean you're good at getting results. Uh -huh. Just because you're a high eye doesn't mean you're good a good communicator. It means you like communicating with other people and you don't have problems walking up to a stranger, but it doesn't mean you're any good at it. And that's that's going back to a mistake that companies make. They use a tool like DISC that somebody's interpreted to say, oh, we need people who like people. No, a high eye doesn't say they like people. A high eye says they like talking with people where they like being the center of attention and they need people around them. So uh, again, we work with multiple different platforms. We do use DISC in the hiring process on occasion, um, but we also use skill testing, we use personality testing, we use cognitive testing. Sometimes, um, and when I say cognitive testing, it's not, are you smart? You can have, I, I lived in Lancaster County, uh, Pennsylvania for 30 years. And when I started this business, some of my earliest clients were Amish and Mennonite. Huh. And eighth, grade's indica eighth grade indications. Um, the Amish businessmen are very savvy. They had these CEO peer groups, you know, 
uh, that they met us. Literally, I, I did a session, second story barn, which is very hot in July, by the way. Uh, uh, yeah. And they were reading the books. They were reading the bestseller books, the Tom Peters books, um, the Peter Drucker books. They were reading these bestsellers. They're very, very savvy. And they wanted to know, um, you know, about not necessarily about testing, but about leadership and things. So we did these profiles and it was really, really interesting um, because I ended up doing some cognitive testing. They were in the, some of them were in the top 2% of the population. Wow. They're super smart. Their minds are spinning. You can, you can, <clears throat> see, you can see the gears turning. They are super smart. I've had a PhD, or it wasn't a PhD, it was a PhD, MD, Nobel winning um, scientist uh, from Stanford, it was Stanford to UCLA, I don't recall, this was early in my in my career, uh, it, was, it was 20 some years ago, who through a consultant did a cognitive test and he couldn't explain how this, how this um, doctor who graduated University of Michigan Medical School at 17 years old, he couldn't wow. even get a license, he couldn't even drive his car yet. He had a medical, he, he was, he, he basically could be licensed as a physician, scored in the lower 20 percentile of cognitive tests. And the reason is, is that he was so methodical, so analytical that he had five choices and it's timed. So the goal is how many correct answers can you get within five minutes? Ah. Well, he went, to, he, he said, well, you know, on question three, you only gave me five choices, but there were two other options that you didn't include. And he said, so I don't think this test is valid. I don't think it's right. And I said, why did you choose research and not emergency trauma? And he said, well, I could do it. And I go, of course you can do it. You're a super smart guy. But the pace of working in a trauma center, when you've got 30 seconds to make a decision and you can't evaluate all the options because the person will be brain dead or die is how do you manage to do that? And he said, well, you don't understand anything like <laughs> about what I do is because when we get a grant, we may only have five years to complete the work. <laughs> so here time frame, well, how do we get all this done in five years? And as an emergency or a trauma physician, he'd have 30 seconds. He couldn't process all that information. He had yeah. the intellect ability, but he wasn't yeah. doing it. So anyway. Yeah. So um, it's interesting because the company that I came from, everybody in the company got the disc assessment. And so, and that's hundreds of people. So I thought that was that was a pretty uh, strong effort to uh, up the ante of communication, I yeah, think. Absolutely. Yeah, I was impressed. Yeah, so, I mean, for companies that are hiring with culture, I mean, if they're not using the assessment from a, are they a good job fit? But do they fit in their culture? Do they fit on the team? We want to make sure that there's people that understand one another. Those are good reasons to use profiles like DISC. Um, but again, people then also extrapolate that over into, is it job relevant? Does it mean they're good at doing the job? And it doesn't. So there's a really good question I can see here from Lauren. Yes, I, want, yeah, I wanted to share this with Lauren. And Lauren is asking, uh, DISC, Predictive Index, Myers-Briggs, Strength Finders, which ones uh, do what and what are the key differentiators? Before we go any further, I've only committed you for a half an hour. We are seven minutes past that, eight minutes past that. Are you okay to stay with us? I am. I, okay. I, love, I love talking about it, obviously. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. 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 And, and this, is a, this is actually a great question. So thanks, Lauren, for asking it. Um, by the way, for, for years and years and years, Predictive Index said they weren't a DISC assessment. They were five fact. They were five. They had ABCDE. ABCD always, and, and if there's anybody that could dispute me on this, nobody's ever been able to do it. So if there's anybody out there that can tell me differently, is that pr Predictive Index was based on the same behavioral model, four style model as DISC. ABCD had the same definitions as DISC. The E was this fifth scale that they added. Recently, they dropped the E. And if you look at, if you go to their, their websites, if you look at their profiles, it really is DISC. I mean, it's just DISC by a different name. It's a different platform. Um, if you're using Predictive Index, I know Predictive Index is, is highly recommended for hiring. I sort of disagree with that uh, for the same reasons I just said. I don't think that A, B, C, or D predicts how good somebody is in the job. 
predicts how they're going to behave in the job, but it doesn't mean, necessarily mean they're good at doing it. Um, so DISC um, predictive index, um, and there's a lot of different versions of DISC, and they go by different names as well. They're all based on this four style behavioral model that was popularized by William Martin, uh, William Moulton Marston, who also wrote Wonder Woman. So <laughs> it was actually, that was where his work came from. Um, Myers-Briggs is based on Carl's Young model. It, it basically is a four quadrant system, similar to the four style. And then each of those four quadrants was divided into four more quadrants. So you have 16 types. Okay, similar, but different. And there's some overlap between Myers-Briggs and DISC, but it's not perfect. Um, but similar, if you're using one, you know, I find DISC and most of my clients have found DISC easier to understand, uh, especially when you're doing a communication. I it's, it's easier for me to identify you, Lee, as a D or an I than it is to say, oh, you're well, maybe as an extrovert or introvert, but are you an INTJ or are you, a, you know, an, an ENTJ? Um, or, you know, it, it's just more complicated for people to do it. So from a self-development tool, Myers-Briggs is marvelous. From a, from a personal development, from a self-awareness tool, uh, from, a, from interchanging, it takes a little bit more work uh, to be able to do it. Um, the, um, what was the other one? Uh, oh, Strength Finders. Strength Finders is Gallup. Very, super popular. That's a completely different platform. That was based on, you know, I think they got 21 million people in their database. Um, that it was based on their study of people's, you know, what what were people's strengths and what were people and, and their weaknesses. The chat, the problem I have with with um, with strengths finders is not on identifying your strengths. I think it's really, really important to know what you're good at. What I have a problem with is that people tend to focus on those five things and then say, well, I'm not very good at analysis. There, and it's and the assessment says I shouldn't, you know, that's not my strength. So I'm not going to worry about it. And by over people, and I've seen this for 25 years, people who get tripped up, and especially at senior levels, people who who finally sort of life catches up to them don't get caught up because they weren't good at what they did. They get caught up because they didn't recognize what their weakness was or what their vulnerable area was. So people, you know, how many people you, you've been around long enough to know a lot of some of the CEOs, you uh -huh. know, that were bull in a China closet. I mean, uh -huh. they got things done. Um, what was it? Uh, Chainsaw, uh, uh, Chainsaw Al. Remember Al from Dunlap from uh, Sunbeam? You yeah, know, you know, I mean, basically everybody said, wow, you know, you just come in and you're ruthless. You're not the, the Jack Welsh that you said you have ABC players and you you try to develop the C's and then you get rid of them if they don't do it. You just get rid of the C's. In fact, you get rid of the B's too. You only hire A players and you just gut organizations, just get rid of anything that doesn't work, anybody who doesn't fit. Um, the problem with that was, is that they were vulnerable, whether it was vulnerable, narcissism, egotism. They, they basically couldn't, they had no, they, there was no ability to, to develop rapport. They didn't work on their soft skills. They had lower emotional intelligence. There was all these things that are out there. But you've seen other ones, people who lack integrity. They're really, really good at what they do, but they lack integrity. Uh, or they don't share some certain values or they don't have high morals. So everybody has a vulnerable spot. And the problem with strengths, that, not, it's not a problem with strengths finders. The problem is people like to focus because it's easy and go, here's my focus. Here's what I'm going to look for. I'm going to design a career around these five things. And they ignore everything else. Even even the strength finders report and in the books, it will say you have to recognize what your vulnerable areas are. But people tend to, to you know, as I said, even with DISC, you have four styles. You have DISC. It's sometimes more important to know what your lowest one is than your highest. So if your highest one, if your highest DISC behavioral style is a, as is, let's say 75%, but your lowest is 10%, your furthest away from the middle and that 10%, that's your dominant style. But everybody looks, you know, their reports are written to the top and getting, I'm getting into the weeds a little I bit. Think that's, I actually think that's a really valid point that 
that I don't want to gloss over. Can you repeat what you said one more time to make sure that the audience gets this? Because this sure. to me what would be a game changer. So, so DISC and all assessments are, are, are basically measured pretty much on a zero, you know, a one to a hundred scale. So on DISC, there's a graph and whether it's horizontal or vertical, uh, or I guess it's the other way around, vertical or horizontal, um, is that 50% is situational. So if you're 50%, it doesn't mean you're a nobody. It doesn't mean you're average. It just means that you're you're energized sometimes, you're not energized by other. Okay. If you're what we call above the line or a high, okay, you're above that 50% mark. Okay. If you're 100, you're as furthest away from that as you could. That's, that's definitely your strong. If you are zero, you're furthest away. That's you're least energized by that. So I'm going to go back to the 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 I these people. If I'm a high I, if I'm 100% I, I am high, most highly energized by interacting and influencing other people. If I'm a zero, I'm least energized. In fact, I'm de-energized by the need to influence or interact with other people. Okay. So if I'm a manager, if I'm an employee, I'd much rather send an email or a text than ever talk with somebody face to face or go on a call. I will hope I will call them at 531 because I know they turn off the phones at 530 because I can leave a voicemail if you are a tend to be a low eye. Now, if you're a high eye, you, you don't even leave a voicemail. As soon as it goes there, you hang up and wait till you can talk to them live. The important part of that is is that people ignore the low. So let's take that same example. Let's say I was a 75% I. That's my highest point. I'm a 75% I. But my S is 10%. And the low S means, high S means I'm, I have, a, I have an, er, a tendency to, an energy to be steady, predictable. I like my days to... To, to know what a low S has a sense of urgency. They like change. They're in, they're they're engaged. They're motivated by change. The most dominant style that you would see from me is not the seventy five, wow. but the ten. Yeah, I'm furthest away from that midpoint. The midpoint is a midpoint, so I'm furthest away on that. People always ignore that. They will say on a salesperson, again, I'll go back to sales, because most, say, most companies will hire DIs because that's the stereotypical salesperson. They're direct, they're engaging, they're assertive, and they're outgoing. Okay. They ignore the fact that there is zero C. What's zero C? I'm de-energized more than anything else by details, following through, um, procedures, <laughs> following the law, following the guidelines. The most dominant thing that you will, behavior you will see is not the D, but the low C. So D, the DISC profiles really have a DISC and a low DISC. There's really eight factors. Very few of the publishers of the models focus on all eight. Wow. The reports only focus on, and that might have been another difference that you saw in the one you took. You took mine yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, one yeah. of the difference maybe is is what the focus was. If it's only focused on above the line, the top, then a lot of the descriptors will be very different. So yeah. you really have to focus on all eight. And again, most people don't do that. That goes back to a problem with Myers Briggs because Myers Briggs only focuses on the tops. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. I, I think that's fascinating. So I, I do want to make a point here. Sonal's made two comments. She said, a great point. No assessment tool is perfect. Um, it's all about taking all the data with a grain of salt, applying to self-improvement and not abusing it, especially for hiring. And she also said, if I had a nickel for every time a hiring manager said, I need a red insights or D from disc or an extrovert ENT from Myers Briggs. It's not about being better or worse. Those are not hiring tools. 
I think so, she cleaned that up. I think that was cleaned up, right? <laughs> yeah, well, she cleaned it up. So I do want to say one other thing. When you take these assessments, I think that people will do very much what I did with you, Ira, and I'm just now thinking about that. You take these assessments very personally, right? And you look at this feedback and you're like, oh my God, <laughs> this is a list of character defects and flaws in me. Don't talk to her about this. Don't say it like this. Do this, do that. I'm like, geez. So that is not how we should be taking these. And well, as a human being, when you're looking at these assessments, how should we be evaluating them about ourselves? Well, first of all, it's interesting that you said that because the disc report all listed, there, there are 20 pages in it, 21 pages, depending on your report. And most of them wrote about your strengths, not about your weaknesses. Yeah. So, well, so people. I so guess people, I'm not a narcissist. That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Again, we all want to be perfect, and we don't like it. We look in the mirror, and I look in the mirror and go, "Gosh, I had a lot of you know. My hair is longer now than it's been in, <laughs> since college. I mean, I had shoulder length hair, you know, and a lot of it, you know, a long time ago. So I don't necessarily like that, but." That's who I am. So we look in the mirror and we see all our faults. So part of it is you're going to be hard on yourself. Um, the, the reports, most most of these reports are really written to the opposite. I mean, managers hate them because they say, well, it says this person's really good. I think they're all, they're, it seems too favorable. So you, you kind of zeroed in on the things you didn't like, um, but there was a lot of good things in there. So what is that number one rule? Understand that they're neutral. However, is they're not perfect. They're still just instruments. We're getting better with AI, machine learning. Um, it'll be really interesting with like facial and voice recognition in years to come, what assessments are going to look like. But for now, this is sort of the best we got. Um, what I suggest doing is sharing it with somebody you're com who, who two things you're comfortable with, who knows you well, and share it with someone who is willing to tell you you're full of it. Um, you go, gosh, I took this test from Ira and it said, what's one thing that you didn't like about it that it said, Lee? Um, she needs a lot of uh, coddling is how I translated it. A lot of positive okay. feedback. So it says, you know, hey, Ira, so you come to me and go, I, I've known you for years. We're, you know, very comfortable. Know you inside and out. And you say, what do you think about this? I don't agree with the statement at all. I don't really think I, I need a lot of Kylan. I, I'm not high maintenance. I don't like this at all. And I look at it and I smile. <laughs> and I, I'm not saying that because I don't know. I'm, I'm saying you can't with that because you didn't like the statement. That's exactly what happens. People, right. I say, if you don't get these reports, and I'm not get, get it, whether it's a disc, a Myers-Briggs, a predictive index, a strength finder, get the report, cross out anything you don't like in pencil. Oh, great idea. Or highlight. And take it to somebody you really know well. And again, not just knows well, but is willing to say you're full of crap. <laughs> yeah, you do this all the time. And if they say, I've never, ever, ever seen you do this. This is just, this isn't you. Cross the statement out. The chances are you're, some people will cross out one or two statements. Some will cross out none. The most critical, the high C, going back to our high Cs, the high Cs, the high judgment on, on Myers-Briggs, will cross out about 20% of it. But it still means 80% is accurate. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And, and so ultimately, that's my exercise when, when people say, how do, what do I do with this? I go, and you know, if they need a debrief or we're in a meeting, that when people when I distribute these in a session, I don't do many live sessions, but I want to distribute in a session. We I talk about the basis, what it means, everything we talked about, how there's no good or bad, what what it means if you're high and you're low. And then we give out the reports. Everybody gets the report. I say, okay, for the next 15 minutes, I want you to read through this. Take a pencil and cross anything that you disagree with. And you can highlight, if you have a highlighter or something, highlight anything that just nails you, <laughs> that just, boy, this was perfect. And for anything you disagree with, give it to somebody that you work with, that knows you well, and get their permission for you to take a black marker and take it out. Nice. I, I, think can, that's tell you, I can tell you on less than, I can count on, on one hand 
and I don't need all the fingers, how many times people have been given permission to cross it out? Because I, you may not like it, but other people go, well, you used to do that, or I don't see you do it all the time, or you don't do it as much around me, but you know, when you're around Joe or you're around Debbie, boy, yeah, I can see that come out. I would ask her if you can cross it out. <laughs> <laughs> I think that this is an important exercise and we're coming up uh, on 55 minutes here. Wow, that, that went fast. So I, I think that it's an important exercise to do because self-awareness is so important today, right? And, and the only way that we can grow. I mean, everybody's talking about emotional intelligence. Every, yeah, I get yeah. so often to say, do you have an emotional intelligence test? I said, the first thing about emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Right. How, how many of your, how many of your people have actually been coached, mentored, or taken That's an assessment right. like this? And they right. go, oh, we don't believe in those. Oh, right. okay. So I'll tell you right now, your emotional, your EQ scores are going to be really, really low because the first step in doing it is self-awareness. That's right. That's right. So I'm I'm a full believer in that. One of the my, nicest compliments, in fact, I would get this a lot in my reviews, and these are from senior leaders in the organization, that you are very self-aware. So I, I think that that's a wonderful compliment. Um, oh, absolutely. And, I, and I'll take it all day long. So Ira, thank you so much for joining us. This was exceedingly insightful and helpful, and I'll get the recording up. Uh, just as soon as we are done here. But if you could hang on for just a second while I say goodbye to everybody who joined us on YouTube, YouTube, on YouTube and LinkedIn. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions for Ira, uh, don't hesitate to connect or reach out to him. He is on LinkedIn. We are connected. Happy to make introductions. And everyone have a wonderful day. Thanks again. See you.